Hi everybody and big welcome to a CSA Deck Tech video with Unrivaled who has actually won the Mox Masters with CSA. Hello everyone, my name is Chico, also known as Unrivaled and uh, yeah, let's talk a bit about CSA and uh, some of my deck choices. Speaking of your deck choices, you have a lot of various cards that are a little bit unique to what I normally see. But can I right. just begin by asking, like, why did you pick Cissé of all things? Like, what sparked your heart for this commander among all the different options that you have out there? So I've been playing Cissé for a long time now, even before I was playing CDH, like even in a more casual setting. Cissé was like my favorite commander. Back then I was playing with Shrines as the team of the deck. And when I started playing competitive and I found out that my casual commander could be played in competitive, I just I don't know, I just felt like I wanted to try it and I've been playing for a long time, trying to make it work. I don't think it was as popular like about a year ago, but nowadays it's one of the strongest decks for sure. I think a lot of new cards have made it a lot better and uh, that's kind of the nature of the card as well. She's um, actually sitting on a pretty good uh, win rate position in tournaments. You definitely spiked that increase a tiny bit. So I have this little tournament ranking and you have just entered into it because you playing that tournament game became the number 10th because that's where my benchmark is. Once you have 10 tournament games and a positive win rate, you get onto my cool leaderboard. So here we have Unrivaled at 30.91. So you clearly kind of know what you're doing. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool to be on this list now. Uh, I was kind of disappointed that I wasn't on the first video and then I realized, oh, there's one game missing or one tournament missing. So I went and played and I actually won, which is really cool. And uh, yeah, it's, it's cool to feel recognized. But yeah, I just like the mechanics. I think the fact that it works well against a lot of common interaction is a strong factor. However, However, it is a lot harder to pilot nowadays than it was a year ago because it's become much more famous and stronger in the meta, so people respect it a lot more. And you gotta be way more cautious when piloting the deck and way more trickier than it used to be. So the cards you selected for this deck, there are a few that stand out to me that I don't see that much of when I look at general CC decks in general. So Teferi, Magus of... Uh... Salfir. What's your take on this Major one? Blue? Yeah, what's your take on this one? Triple blue! That's hard. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the final or not, but that's the card that won the game. <laughs> In oh really? Final. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but this is one of my newest addi uh, additions. I've added about a month and a half ago, two months ago. I've been so happy with the choice right now, and I'm honestly, I actually like that I'm one of, one of the few people using it as well. I think my list is designed to play a proper mid-range game, and against other mid-range decks, it gets to a point where it's really hard to ever force a win without giving the win to someone else. So I found this card, and I was like, wait, this is the best thing ever because I don't even need to play CSA ever. You can just stay chilling on the command zone for the whole game. I'm not creating any threats for my opponents. And whenever I'm ready, I can just maybe crack my Ranger to stop somebody else from winning. And then once that resolves, I can play my uh. Teferi from hand and go for the win, you know? So that's one of the plans that I was thinking of when adding it to the deck and I've managed to do it quite a few times in this uh, just short amount of time and it's been a huge success so far. So you're basically setting up to be ready for the instant speed win. And he's just sitting there and looking casual, and then boom, you win in yeah, instant speed. Yeah, and with everybody silenced as well. And I think nobody, no one expects me to pass turn with CC on the command zone, but still win on the same rotation. It's weird. It's not yeah. a common mechanic. So people lower their guard towards me, and that's a big advantage. But what about the triple blue? Isn't that annoying? I guess that's the first thing people think about when they when they look at the card. But I mean, CC is the one deck where color fixing is done the be the best. I think out of all the top decks. So True. this is why I tried it out, and I haven't had that much problems with it. I mean, sometimes I do, but you can still make it work, I think. Then you played Sigarda Fount of Blessings. Other permits you control have Hexproof. You may look at the top card of your library in time. You may cause an angel spells and human spells from top of your library. You do have some humans, but they're not that many. The biggest reason to, for it to be here is the X proof, mainly because yeah. Bowmasters is such a big problem currently for the deck, like it's one of the strongest cards in the format, and I really do feel the need of having that card. Every time I played it, it's been 10 out of 10 for me, and I've actually, even the human part is actually relevant sometimes, because I might have an air tie on top and be able to, like, counterspell off the top of my deck is actually yeah, he's a human. Uh, kind of a cool thing. And also Sakashima is also human, and sometimes casting a clone from top of the deck. It's yeah, not something that, it's not there for those purposes, but it's some synergy that come up. Olivia is a very common CSA card for those who don't know. She's a haste enabler. Colossal Sky Turtle is a cool card with Kinnan as you can flip into it but you don't have Kinnan as your commander but it's a cool creature still like I don't normally see Sky Colossal Sky Turtle in CSA. I do see it a lot in Kinnan. What's your yeah, opinion on it here? I mean it, it's not it, 
I, the goal is to never <laughs> play it as a creature. I mean, maybe yeah. in a really weird game, it might be good. But when I was thinking about the deck, I just wanted to have a lot of cards that are hard to interact with. The big mm. Teferi is an, an example of that because it's a creature. And once it lands, it's, it can't be removed unless it's a channel effect. So I was kind of thinking, I, I tested Touch the Spirit Realm and I was really happy with the card. And I was like, wait, I really want to try to go all out in this channel ah, effect cards. And Colossus Cartel was just one that whenever I drew it, it's always feels like I drew a good card. Because even if I, there's nothing good to bounce, the first ability to return the card from the graveyard to your hand is still so good. Like you can, I've done like silence an opponent and then si next turn I put the silence back in my hand, silence again. It's just a good interaction card. And also because the deck suffers a bit from when, when you have to discard stuff to the graveyard and then you can't get it back. This is a card that helps it get back in your hand. You play Orcish Bowmaster, Emil, Archivist of Ogma, the Revi, Dockside, Ignoble, Fire Mastermind, Frex and Metamorph. What's your take on Frex and Metamorph? I personally think Frex and Metamorph is an amazing card in general that you could throw into most decks in general. Yeah, it's one of the recent additions as well, but he should have been there for a longer time, I think. Mm -hmm. Especially with the One Ring coming into the format a couple months yeah. ago, the card has become even better. And like for the mid-range plan, it just makes sense. So many people are playing good creatures to clone, and then the One Ring as well as a second option uh, that you see almost every game. For three mana, it's so good. And the fact that you can even use it in a later stage of the game to like tutor him, it, see, say, and then if there's a dog set on the, on the field, you can try to make infinite mana, flickering the clone. I, I mean, it just... There's so many good things about the card. I don't know why I wasn't running it before, to be honest. <laughs> CC is also a deck that a commander kind of likes clones, I've realized, because once your opponent plays a commander, there's another legendary option for you. So you can gain colors. Yeah, exactly. Like taking someone's or cloning a Chrome is actually kind of good for CC. Yeah, exactly. Even Talion is a thing. Like, I'm not, I'm not running Talion, but I can clone somebody else's Talion, and that's just very good for me for three mana. Um, why don't you play yeah, Talion? But I have actually clones. thought about playing Talion myself. If I could have more cards in the deck, I would I would add in Talion and some others. But I don't know what to take out. I don't think I would take out Sigarda or, or Teferi for it. As draw engines in terms of creatures, I really like Ferry Mastermind and Archivist of Ogma. They've been excellent for me. I think for mana would be too much. And every scenario that Archivist or Teferi were good for me, Talion would not have been as good. Okay. So that's why I haven't added it in yet. I have actually not added it myself because I'm not looking for more value engines, but I think it's a maybe option for me. A lot of people might misunderstand how good Lofo actually is because it's just sitting there giving you a small treasure now and then. Yeah. It's one of the best legendaries. It's it's only not as good because it came out at the same time as Orkish Bowmaster. If, yeah. if not, it would be one of the best, if not the best legendary, I think. I understand the take of not thinking about drawing a lot of cards with the CC deck because you have a tutor in the command zone. However, as the deck has become more famous and every other CDH deck also evolved over the last year, I think it's really easy to stop CC if you just go for a CC plan, like a normal CC plan. Any removal stops all the lines that you don't have a Three fairy to protect, mm -hmm. and any opposition agent or I don't know, Dranit or Grafdigger's Cage can slow you down so much. And if you don't have a draw engine to fall into, you're never gonna be back into the game. And this is why I kind of bet on this. Uh, so many value engines like Archivist of Ogma and Fairy Mastermind, because I know every game that I go in, unless it's like three monocolor decks and me, I know that if it's normal decks. I'm going to be stopped if I just go for the normal plan, and usually the grind plan is much more reliable. I actually think a lot of my games I have won with CC have come with uh, just attrition, just being able to produce win attempts after win attempts, and just eventually people just can't keep up. They don't have enough uh, resources to deal with it over and over. But that only comes when you're able to have like a good uh, mid-range uh, stability to fall back on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree. Uh, then you're playing all the planeswalk, or well, not not all the planeswalker, but the typical planeswalkers. I think these are yeah. more or less the six planeswalkers that I'm usually always seeing. So Teferi, Time Reveler is an out include in my, or well, that's in my opinion. Uh, what do you think, Teferi? I 100% agree, yeah, it's yeah. one of the best cards in the deck. Then we have some of the other uh, combos, so you have Aminatu, Nicobolas, and the Oath of Teferi down here, we'll get to enchantment soon. Uh, why did you choose that combo? For those that uh, don't know me, I don't. I play a lot of Cissé, I don't play the Planeswalker combo, and I often explain and talk about it, so it's perfect that we have someone that disagrees with me, that's that's great. <laughs> what's, what's your take? Or let me put it like this. Why am I wrong? 
I mean, you're not necessarily wrong, but from my experience, this combo is just very strong. I mean, it sucks to have like two cards that aren't that good in the deck, which is Nicol Bolas and Oath of the Fetty, especially Oath of the Fetty is really not that good by itself. But the combo allows for so many lines to be played and for so many win attempts to be done one turn earlier than they would without those cards that I've tried playing without it. I, and it just doesn't feel the same and I don't think it's worth it especially for this kind of build where you have so many other cards that aren't here for the CC plan at least the ones that are here for the CC plan need to be very effective and uh, very optimized to be able to make it work fast I agree that uh, the Nico Bolas you're basically sacrificing card quality inside the 99 for more speed more or less is a good summarization, I yeah. think. What is your take on Shahili? Shahili is something, I honestly, it's been play on a, on a lot of these CC decks for a while, but I wasn't running it for a long time. I started playing it like three months ago, and I'm really happy. I was not seeing the potential at first. Only after I tried it, I was like, yeah, this is really good. Because not only it has a lot of synergy with Dockside, and you can just chain the whole uh, Aminato Nicol Bolas line starting from a dog side and Sahili, or even a clone and Sahili for, with a dog side on the, on the field. But also it has a lot of synergy with Fabudo Elder and Bloom Tender, and that's really good. I used to play other legendary cards that would fill that spot in order to make Bloom Tender and Fabudo Elder better in some of the lines, but I think Sahili is the best one. And speaking about cards that actually make your Bloom Tender better, you have Tyvar. Uh, this one I do like. And now I actually want to ask you a question. You're playing Olivia and Tyvar. You have two haste enablers. Now, they are both on CMC free. My question is, do you feel that you need both? Or are you like speculating about cutting one of them? Yeah, I feel like I need both because mm -hmm. Tyvar is a very good hasty enabler, but is very fragile as a planeswalker. And because I can't just force a win all the time, it's just not going to be like, of course, if I have a Tyvar in hand, maybe I can have a line to win, but it's not a smart decision to make. Like the best decision to make is to not play the card. So if I'm not going to play the card, then I rather have a card that I can play, you know, and Olivia is that card in terms of having an ace enabler that I'm not afraid to play it because I'm not necessarily going to force a win. So nobody's going to waste interaction on me. Mm -hmm. And also, it's just not going to die to creatures if I play it. So it's not a waste of a play. So this is how I think about it. I mean, there's also the, the four mana one. I forgot the name now. Also, Rakdos card, that ace enabler. Yeah, but four mana is um, a little bit too much. You want to shrink yeah, exactly, the yeah. CMC cost as much as you can. Olivia also has a lot of synergy with the uh, Agatha Soul Cauldron, which is one of the best cards in the deck at the moment. So True. This we is why I that include one soon. But Tyvar as well. So I can see the appeal for Olivia. She stays around longer and safer. But do you need Tyvar still in that case? What's the appeal for having yeah, both? Tyvar is also a sub for the Revi in a lot of lines. Like if mm -hmm. you don't have the Revi for some reason, it died or it's exiled or whatever. Tyvar can do its job because whenever you flicker your big dark like bloom tender or whatever it comes in with haste and if it's with olivia that won't well that will not work in an infinite combo mm. because every time it comes in to give him haste you need to discard the card and you, Tyver, the, you don't yeah. have that kind of condition yeah so also the recur it's just more recursion and i think recursion is really good uh, in this kind of deck so yeah it's too many ups to the card uh, i think it's worth running both and then we have the harder binder of wills and this is a planeswalker that i view similar to teferi that is good on its own like all these other planeswalker cards are basically synergizing with it, each other or in some other shape or form but the harder kind of stands on her own uh, what's your take on the harder uh, it's a very solid card on the deck yeah. i mean it's very flexible can even sometimes be used as a value engine a little bit but even, even though it's kind of like on desperate moments bump cc without losing any mana right so like if yep. cc is a 2-2 you play the from hand you make the four mana that you wasted and you just bump cc to a 5-5 so that's really good and also it opens up a lot of lines like there's lines you can do where if you don't have a dock side you can still do the nico bolas aminato chain starting mm -hmm. from the uh, Daihada, as long as you have three more mana at the start of it. So it, it allows for more lines even to, to go even faster for a win, so that's also why I run it. Also, because I'm on Breach, it also has a lot of synergy with Breach, surprisingly, her and Tyvar. Yes. We might as well just jump down to the enchantments. One thing I really like about, or one thing I think Cissé should be starting dabbling into, is other combos that is outside of Cissé. Because sooner or later, it's going to be an op agent, you can have Dry Knight Magistrate, you're going to have something that's just making it hard for CC to do her thing. And having some decent combos inside deck, I think, is a good approach. You chose Andul Breach, and I make. Let's just find the card Lion Side Die. Lotus Petal. You will not find it. You don't yeah. play Lion Side <laughs> Die, but you do play Brain no. Freeze. Uh, that's. Yeah. I have. There it is. 
strange art. But there's the brain freeze. So you play Lotus Petal, Underworld Breach, but no Lions of Diamond. Why no Lions of Diamond? I have the win con with Breach there and Brain Freeze, but it's not a win con that I want to go for almost never. I mean, there's, there are some situations where I can go for it and it's the best choice, but that's not the plan of the deck. And I've tested uh, LED, mm -hmm. and it's not a completely dead card for the CSA plan. It's actually kind of relevant sometimes to make that extra mana, but it's not enough card quality for me to be worth the slot and mm -hmm. i'm okay with doing it with only lotus petal because the deck already produces so much mana with so many other cards that for me to start the brain freeze bridge combo i usually have enough fuel in terms of mana to start it off and and then eventually i get the petal and and it's done but it's not something i'm going for and as you were talking about having different combos on the deck that are not related to cc uh, i guess the most common one would be Tassa's Oracle. I've tried that one with both consultation or without and just tinted pact. I mean, mm -hmm. the problem with it is that the cards alone aren't good at all. I think maybe tinted pact can be good, but the other two are really not that good. And the thing is, Breach alone is a very good card on this deck, I think. Like, especially because it would suffer so much from a board wipe in some scenarios, and Breach can just... I think mostly I use it as a value engine other than a win con. And Brain Freeze is arguably the worst card in my list. Like, yeah. it's the least quality card in my list. But it's still relevant a lot of times because the Storm decks, I can kill them off with just brainstorming them on top of a draw. Stopping a top deck tutor from someone else that's gonna win them the game and just mill them the card. It's not a completely dead card, even it's one of the lowest quality card cards in the deck. I would agree. Then you play Touch of the Spirit Realm, you already mentioned that. Smothering Tight, I personally really like Smothering Tight. I usually try to tutor for Smothering Tight in CSA. It, that's been working out kind of good for me, how's your feeling about that? I, I had uh, some moments where, uh, like in the past, where I, that's what, I, what my plan was, but as my playgroup started to know my deck better, and also I guess everyone started to know the deck better, I think Smothering Tight is too much of an aggro play to push for, for no reason, or like just for value for myself. It's a very strong card, it's, I really like this card, and I, I don't think I'll swap it soon. You can't just play it whenever you can play it. I think you need to wait for the right moment, and by this I mean when someone else is really strong on the table, that if you play this, people cannot waste the counter on you because they're too scared of someone else. That's the best moment to play this kind of card. It's kind of like Seedborn News on some like Trust yeah. deck where people think it will get out of control. But if you play it where you know the other guy's about to win, then they will let it resolve. And that's the best yeah. moments to kind of go for Smothering Tight as well. Ristic Study, No Brainer, Oath of the Fairy, which is doubling the Planeswalker activations, which allows you to make the cool loop. Mystic Remora, No Brainer. And then we have the Cultist of the Absolute that I'm starting to see appear more and more in CSA builds. I I personally don't like it. I play it now and then. Is this an auto include for you or where where's your stance on the cultist? Yeah, actually since I've tried it it's been an auto include for me. I think the card like this deck needs explosiveness in my opinion, especially my list in particular that I don't have as many tutors for Dockside as usual as like some other lists. I don't have Eldritch Evolution, no Battle of Ikoria, no um, Finale of Devastation. So the deck loses a bit of its explosiveness factor in getting a Dockside to the field. And these cards adds a bit back to that explosiveness factor. And it's not like I, I, the sacrifice creature part always looks bad to CSA pilots, but it's only if CSA is on the field that that's activated. And with my game plan of not playing CSA for no reason if I'm not if I don't need to this actually doesn't affect me at all and honestly I, it's one of those cards that have made me go from 0 to 100 in one turn and hmm. nobody saw it coming because how would you and also it combos really well I think the fact that this card in the deck allows for uh, a line where you can go for a win with CSA from 2 power I think you've done a video on this before yeah chromatic yes order. it's um, the uh, link in the description below of the video if you want to know how cult of the absolute the harder and Chromatic Array and the Revi makes a win. Yeah, also instead of the Revi, you can also just go for the Aminato line. Yeah. And it works the same. I've never, to be honest, I don't think that line is like super amazing. Literally in like 300 games, I've done it like twice because yeah. I could have done it more often, but it's just too risky to, to be a good play. But having it in the deck just feels nice. Like having that possibility for some more um, desperate situations feels really good. I can agree. It's always nice to know that I can win next turn. And just by having this card yeah, exactly. in the deck just opens that. Which actually takes <laughs> us to Chromatic Array. I don't like this card. I do like having it inside the deck for this specific combo. But I consider it kind of a dead card just how expensive it is. 
Okay, well, uh, that's what I us used to think before I tried it as well, but after I tried it, I've also been liking it as well, just from play playing it from hand. I think from turn 4 or 5, I usually have mana to play it. I mean, True. it's not. I, I think it's a bit like Smothering Tight, as in people get really scared of that card, even though it's not as dangerous as Smothering Tight, in my opinion. But sometimes you can even play it with, like, Oppo on the field, and you just use it as a draw engine, really. I I've used it with cloning. I, I played it, and then I tapped it to play a Sakashima the Imposter cloning uh, Seedborn Muse. Then I was just drawing cards the whole rotation. Now we have I got a Soul's Cauldron. So when you talk about like some of the best cards that have improved CSA, there are a few cards that like are mentioned there. And I think I got a Soul's Cauldron being kind of new is going to go to the kind of you, what you could call a Hall of Fame of some of the best cards that have improved CSA. I personally think it's an out include. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, 100%. It's an S tier card. It's just every single line of text in that card is good for the deck. Yeah. Um, also, one thing that I think Cissé was lacking before was uh, before this card was printed was a way to make Cradle be strong in the deck without having to tweak the deck list uh, too much, and this just allows for that. So it's like just, the deck just became so strong because Cradle is so much better now with this card in. So it's a really strong card and in this deck in particular I think you can take advantage of it ma maximum than every other deck can. Relic of Legends. That's a card I actually don't play personally. I, I, well, I do know that a lot of CC players really love it. Because if you think about it, well it's a 3 mana mana rock, but Whenever you go for any C cell line, literally any C cell line, every chain, like this is all chains. So each activation, yeah. for each activation, it will cost one less mana because each legendary that's coming in, that's a creature, will tap for itself. Um, so in reality, it's it, you, you're thinking you're paying like three for two or three for three, but you're playing you're paying three mana to get like five mana or six mana. So that's yeah. insane in a deck like this where you need mana and mana fixing all the time. And then obviously the one ring. I don't think yeah, that the one is ring really is an out include, but I think it's a good card. Yeah. Um, again, for those for those games where you're just stuck with an opposition on the field, you need a good card to grind. One ring is one of the best, especially with a deck that's playing the Revy. So you can really yes. use one ring in some scenarios and just draw a lot of cards in one turn. Yeah, that's my take on it. It's one of the best cards. I think whenever I played one ring, I won the game, honestly. Jeweled Lotus. I actually don't play Jeweled Lotus. I don't. I can see the appeal of having it if you're going for the turbo. But one thing that I've noticed is that it is more important that you have your secured pathway of getting a CC activation. Like getting CC into play isn't all... That's kind of easy usually. But you actually mm -hmm. need to climb up to like a five colored activation. And all opening yeah, hands and doesn't have that. And I think that Dual Lotus is just increasing the speed but not solving the big color fixing. 100%. And that's the, the, the thought that everybody that doesn't run Jeweled Lotus is thinking. I, you're completely right. The reason I'm playing Jeweled Lotus is not to play CC turn 1. Like, that's not the point at all. The reason is, again, to get the explosiveness level of the deck higher. The point of this is to play it late game, be able to play CC and have two activations instead of just one. Because I didn't have to use my the other mana that I built when, to, to cast it. Moving into instance, we see the typical thing, except Brain Freeze. We've already talked about that one. But Small Star, Deflecting Swat, Enlightening Tutor, Fears, Fluster, Swan, Silence, Pact, Mindbreak Trap, Mental Misstep. Limdos Vault is something I don't see that often. You already have a bunch of, like you have Whirly Tutor and Vamp Tutor. Now I do know that Limdos Vault is actually going past Opposition Agent. So I'm guessing that's the reason you play Limdos here? Yeah, that was the, the original thought behind the addition of the card. And, and then I started testing it and it's just been so good, like better than I was expecting. It's been relevant in those scenarios to go over an OPPO. Even just as a normal tutor, like one more tutor where you actually know what the next four cards are is relevant as well. Like I've had games where I had a Rhystic and I Limdus Vault before my turn. And then I went to force a win knowing that an opponent had a counter spell. But, but I knew that if he... He's gonna. He can't pay for the Rhystic if he counter spells, and I'm gonna draw the card that allows me to go for the win still, ah. because I knew what it was on top. So it's actually way more relevant than it may seem to know the next four cards. Savine's reclamation. That's in the breach package, and yeah. that's the main reason I wanted to play breach actually in this deck is because of both breach and Savine's reclamation. I think Savine's is so good in this deck. Again, I think the recursion is just very strong. I will agree. And Savine is one of the best cards in terms of recursion. So in your top four that you won, you're here. Four wins, one loss, two draws. You have Jenson, five colored. Then you have Chrome and Rayam. And then you have another Cissé. So how did your top four finals play out, actually, if I may ask? Yeah, usually I don't like the Cissé matchup. I really, it's one of the matchups I hate the most to play against another Cissé. Really? Because it just goes against my plan. It's really stressful. I, I think I was lucky in this final uh, in the sense that the other guy had to mulligan to four. And then oh. he kind of was 
forced to be held hostage to uh, Jensen that was trying to win the game like twice and he was just not playing any spells so he could keep his that right shaman up uh, activation up so that uh, the other guy wouldn't win and he was the only one that had a, an answer at that time so he basically moved to four and then had like two time walks in the same game so he was basically out of the game most of the time why do you view an other cc at the pod as a problem I mean, it's a hard deck to deal with, and I don't think my build in particular wants to... Like, the interaction that I have for that deck is not... I don't want to be using it to stop it. Like, I want to use it on another, on other stuff. I want to be a bit more greedy with my interaction, and pieces of interaction that I have that I'm okay with not being greedy with are interactions that don't affect CC. So, counter spells, for example. I don't mind not being greedy with counter spells. I don't mind using them. I don't need to be the last one with the counter spell in hand. But my removal spells and my channel effects, those are the ones that work best on CC, but those are the, also the ones that I don't want to be just using them for no reason. I, mm. I, I want to save it for the last moment. And having another CC on the pod will make me play not optimal because of that. Let's actually take a look at this other CC. So this is uh, a lot more lo uh, Planeswalkers. We have Indifference from you, Ashiok, Anti-Search, and Uku. I do like Ashiok inside the 99, actually. I think it's a good CC card. I don't play it myself currently, but I do like to see it being played now and then by others. I agree, yeah. Uh, I have I was playing her before the big Teferi as well, like the five-minute Teferi. That, that was the slot that was that, that was in. It's really strong when it comes to interaction. But also, <laughs> I think another reason for swapping it out was that it traumatizes the opponents a bit too much. And then they just start being a, a bit more aggro on your CC than they usually do because they don't want an Ashok to come out. So True. that was also one of the reasons I took it out, actually. Then we play, or this person plays Oku, which uh, you don't play. And I've cut yeah. this buzz one I, as well. I think it's too slow. Exactly. I, I think sorcery speed removal is not good in general. This person is playing Talion and uh, Ruby Daring Tracker. Something I don't see that often. I was running Ruby before I had the, the Phyrexian Metamorph. I think it's a, a cool legendary. You know, there was the human, the Selesnya human that was played before. I forgot the name. Katilda. Katilda is really good if you're just playing against a wall. But currently, with all the Bowmasters in everybody's decks, it just became a lot worse in the deck. And I think Ruby is a nice replacement. Mm -hmm. uh, so I like that choice. Kutsil. I don't think you were playing Kutsil. No. So I know this is the card that everyone was hyping about. See, say it's going to be so good for the Deck. Can't deny uh, it. I know. I, I, yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I think I saw your video on that. I, I never tried it yet. Like I haven't tried it yet, but I don't think. It's as good as people are saying it. I don't think it's bad either, but I think my reasoning makes a lot of sense and it's really simple. I don't think you would ever tutor for this instead of the other Teferi, because usually you're tutoring at the end step. And the strong thing about Teferi is that once it lands, nobody can do anything. But if this lands on somebody's end step, you can still remove it or remove CC or whatever. So it's not nearly as good as Teferi, not, not even close. So if you're not tutoring it, if you're not tutoring for this, then when will it be good? To play from hand? But if you're yes. playing it from hand, when was the last... Like, this is basically playing an Abolisher for value. And when was the last time you saw a CDH deck play an Abolisher for value and the game ending well for that person? Like, I, I literally never saw that or almost never saw that. It always goes bad. It just People will just tunnel vision on you because you did that play and, they have to, and they're just too worried about the Abolisher. And especially on a creature deck like Cissé, they're just going to remove everything you have. Even if they don't remove Cutsil, they remove Cissé, whatever they have to do for you to not be able to win. And that's never good for you, I don't think. So that, that's my view on it again i don't think the card is necessarily bad but i just don't think is as good as it seemed uh, in the beginning i don't Lavinius. know if you agree with what i'm saying or <laughs> no i <laughs> I, just... I i i i don't um, uh, truly agree but uh okay. i mean i i don't think my i've already said my piece about this card i think it's great because the fact that it actually is doing it's something you can can, can cast from your hand compared to the fairy. Like a big thing with the fairy is that you can't leave the fairy and play and pass turn. You have to like make it die or something if you're yeah, not winning true. the turn. And I do see games where like, oh, there's a Grand Abolish in play and the turn goes in a circle and people are starting to worry about that. I do agree that it kind of puts you on a threat market, but you're not going to be the only thing that is going to have like a target on its head. It shouldn't be. And if you're the only one with a target on its head, then apparently you're the only deck at the table that is presenting win attempts. Well, the so thing I, is... I, I can see that, yes, it's going to put a target on you, but that shouldn't be 
I mean, we shouldn't avoid playing good cards just because people get scared of us. I can get behind that, yeah. The, the reason I think a lot of times I, I get more aggro than other decks is because we are showing the cards on the table and a lot of other decks just have the cards in hand. So I think it's natural to be more scared of the, the ones you can see. But I, I definitely can get behind what you're saying as well. That's it for us this time. Thank you so much, Unrivaled, for coming here and congratulations for winning the Mox Masters with Cisse. Really happy about that. Yeah, uh, thank you so much and thanks for having me. And if you actually want to discuss Cisse more in detail, there is a Cisse Discord link in the description below of this video. And also if you want to take a look at Unrivaled's decklist a little bit more in detail, link in the description below of the video. Take care guys, thank you so much for watching.